So how is one species supposed to evolve into another over millions of years if the fossil evidence points to them living at the same time? Their position has perplexed many other evolutionary scientists, but they reported what they found. All three species discovered living at the same time. No papers, no studies, no numbers. Yes, cohabitation of the hominins absolutely happened, and it happened pretty much all throughout human evolution, just as primate species cohabitate now but may yield different lineages down the line. But here's the reason I point to a lack of studies. It looks like, according to current timelines, that while Homo habilis cohabitated with the Australopithecines and with Homo erectus, the latter and the former did not cohabitate with one another. Homo habilis is the one to bridge that gap. I have actually lost count as to how many times I have said this. Yes, the wolves and the domestic dogs can live at the same time. This is basic. But guess what, evolutionist geniuses? The domestic dogs cannot live before the wolves. We cannot live before our grandparents. Heck, we can't even live before our parents. And we definitely can't even live at the same time with our great, great, great grandparents. The fact is, and the evolutionists like Erica here can storyboard all day long. I don't really care, since the way it is, is the way they wish it wasn't, which is typically why they don't even tell the public this data. Until when? Until they are called out on it. But the fact is that their extensive amount of evidence that we see strongly indicates that Australopithecus and Erectus slash Homo sapiens have coexisted based on even some of the most famous sites of paleoanthropological research. Nearly all of what would be considered the famous hominin sites indicate the extensive coexistence of hominin species. It's undeniable. It's irrefutable. Okay? The extensive coexistence of hominin species that paleoanthropologists and proponents of evolution here like Erica have purported have ancestor to descendant relationships. Human bones are found too early is the point. Are they gonna tap out? No, they have too much invested in ape to man evolution being true. Therefore, they will storyboard all day. We can only imagine the storyboards that will result from these arguments, from this data, from this evidence. The pit bull cannot live before the wolf. And we can't live before our parents or even with our great, great, great grandparents. Give it up, evolutionists. Human evolution is dead. They recognized a great deal Here we go, listen to this. Having previously suggested it contained both Homo and Australopithecus. It contained both Homo and Australopithecus. He's saying Australopithecus. Who knows what the real way is to say it. Everybody says it differently. But point is, this is known. There is such coexistence. And if you can get homo bones and Australopithecus bones mixed in for afarensis, why is their argument against, say, Sadib or Habilis that this is not possible? You know, these people are just not being honest with the data or they're not up to date on the data. Maybe I'm more up to date than critics that actually supposedly specialize in this field. I don't know. They chose a mandible as the holotype as they felt that teeth would ultimately be key. In and you, and you hear this from Erica all the time. 
Teeth are so important, ultimately key. Well, let, let's keep listening to Berger on that one. Differentiating species as the ultimate morphological silver bullet. But that idea, the idea that teeth can absolutely discriminate species, has not stood the test of time. Has not stood the test of time. In, in other words, stay up to date on the literature and stop using outdated arguments. The effect of this decision has been that Afarensis has become a very well-known species, but may in fact be a chimera species, particularly where... So here we go, may in fact be a chimera species, which is exactly what we've been saying. It's exactly the conclusion Contested Bones makes, a chimera species, it's a mix. You know, this is, this happens. <laughs> you know, it's not just Piltdown Man where they say that that was an intentional hoax. No, this can happen unintentionally based on the nature of the fossil record, based on the nature of how morphology alone can oftentimes be deceiving. It can deceive us without the genetics. Those cranial remains and isolated teeth are concerned. As we now know that no less than two other species existed in the same time and the same place. And we can have little way of telling what remains belong in the same time and the same place. To which species? We'll look more at this problem when we delve into Afarensis in future lectures. It's just so clear that these guys are now cornered. Actually, the entire thing has been refuted simply based on our previous videos. But I wanted to point out a couple things that they say that are actually demolished simply by what we've already covered simply by the nature of the coexistence of the astrolopiths and the homo genus and the evidence that there are chimeric species. You know, as Lee Berger even said, I mean, th this often happens, especially by a poor and unreliable holotype. So what's funny is Erica appears to imply that the hominin fossil record is not actually incredibly fragmented. Which, when actually pressed, or if we were to ask her, you know, will you go on record where we can show your teachers or show a peer-reviewed team, will you go on record saying that it's not highly fragmented? Then she'll probably admit that it's highly fragmented. So, But remember, when they're doing a video or doing a rebuttal video, they need to make it look like they're destroying creation or they're addressing our arguments or downplaying the arguments. So in this video, you'll see her. She implies that the hominin fossil record is not actually incredibly fragmented, then flashes some random bones on the screen with what appears to be some reconstructions. She's implying that the fossil record is not in incredibly fragmented. And this is the problem with these YouTube, YouTube evolutionists. They need to be honest with the nature of the fossil record. It's low confidence, low quality scientific evidence. They need to own it, embrace it. I'm going to show you quote after quote after quote. I'll try and keep it as entertaining as possible, but sometimes this is the nature of it when you're taking on these guys. So I'm going to show you just how fragmented and pathetic the fossil record is right from their own words. This is why it is stated that based on the design hypothesis, okay, a lot of this data is perfectly consistent with our model. Now, I want to point out because she will go into, in the video, she goes into some transitionals. You got to watch the whole video. I'm just kind of covering up to the point where I am going to show for sake of time. Now she'll point to some transitionals when for one, <laughs> I've always stated that based on the design hypothesis, we would expect some interesting mosaics, but we would expect the rule to be the transitionals. And I pointed this out in the last video that they always want to point to the exception to the rule. The exception to the rule is their argument. If evolution is true, the rule should be mosaics, transitionals, okay? And in the video, she literally proves my point based on the fact that she not only really showed just a few, anyways, given how huge the fossil record is and how many animals truly have gone extinct, and then amplify that a million times fold if deep time evolution is true. They need to be flashing the screen for a week straight <laughs> if deep time evolution is true. But then most of the ones that she flashes are just easily refuted when you actually decide to dissect each one. And when Neff and I, we're going to do a full video on Tiktaalik and the so-called fish to amphibian transition that they say occurred, you're going to see just how easily it's demolished when you really get down deep into the details. But we've got video after video after video demolishing Tiktaalik, whale evolution, the other so-called transitionals. Funny how they can only point to a couple when they should be flaunting countless of them to the point where it is just simply undeniable. No, the fossil record is incredibly scant 
And if Darwin were alive today, he would be saddened as to how much of a failure evolution is. Okay, so I'm going to let me know if there's an echo. I think there's just an echo on that one because it looked like my volume on myself was a little bit loud. So let's screen share. Also, you'll see that that godless engineer pretty much knows nothing about these topics. So let's go. Here we go. So everything up to, you know, the, the, that's kind of the arguments they use. It's pretty weak. Um, you guys could watch through the entire video for a good laugh. Okay, let's go. Gorillas and gorillas and gorillas and nests. Why would we be surprised by a basal shelter appearing before a more sophisticated one in the fossil record? So much of this video is wrong, and what isn't wrong is prison. Are gorillas building the same as to what we, we build? I mean, how primitive are we talking? But here's the thing. Here's the thing. Based on what we talked about earlier, based on the coexistence, based on just quote after quote after quote, I mean, I'd be here all day going over how homogeneous and astralopithecus are in the same place at the same time. Okay, but then they want to attribute clear evidence for humanity and tool making to an astralopith or an ape when clearly it is built by a human. That, that's exactly what the, the evidence suggests. But um, as I indicated in the last video, I, I spent probably about 15 minutes going over the post Babel, post flood model and how it was the rekindling of culture of these people groups that lost everything. And especially at the Tower of Babel, you have people who specialize in different fields working together as a community, like we do today. We got people who are police officers, nurses, doctors, handymen, working on cars, working in food, whatever, you name it. Um, I actually read a portion from my human evolution on it that I per believe perfectly explains the data. And then these people, their languages are confused. And then they're forced to migrate. And you've got skills that are now dispersed and you got people trying to rebuild community they're in desperate times desperate measures survivorship would be key conquests would be occurring so that's what we're seeing you know we wouldn't expect the houses we see today also in the fossil record i mean you know what we're seeing is exactly what we'd expect based on the post babel uh, dispersal actually might as well pull that up here um let's see so the Trinkhouse paper right here that Erica says I misrepresent. Here we go. An abundance of developmental anomalies and abnormalities in the Pleistocene people. Now, what's so funny is they can't get over their basic presuppositions, basic assumptions, because Erica is constantly using arguments that is assuming away the fact that what we see, the rule is coexistence among the Australopithecines, among all your homogeneous, okay, among uh, Neanderthalensis, Erectus, all your different homo species. And often what they say is it's Erectus that are found with these Australopithecines too, that are mixed, okay? So what we see here is the fact that, um, let's see some of these quotes here. Um, you can read through this paper. Substantial number of these abnormalities reflect abnormal or anomalous developmental process, whether as a result of genetic variants altering developmental processes or as the products of environmental or behavioral stress patterns altering expected developmental patterns. Environment would be key. But what's funny is I want to go to the quote where she says doesn't seem to fit our model or says, see, here's the thing. I believe she wants me to just spell it out in these exact words or else I'm misrepresenting the paper. When in fact, if you understood even the basics of our model, you would see that, if you see here in the discussion, it's highlighted, the elevated incidence of rare to exceptional developmental abnormalities among Pleistocene humans raises questions regarding survival, mortuary behavior, levels of stress, Okay, these are just a number of the possible trends, but guess what? These are all exactly what we'd expect. But remember, of course, this author, Eric Trinkos, is not a young earth creationist. So he's got a different interpretation, different starting point, but he's also confused because he doesn't have uh, our model, our starting point. But the fact is what we see is developmental abnormalities. We see conditions, we see pathology, we see disease, we see uh, evidence for conquest, survivorship, stress, stress, stress. These were desperate times. 
issues of survival it goes into. Um, I've actually got this paper printed off. Uh, issues of stress, again, um, goes over some trends. And let's see, conclusion. Now, this is a good paper. So she goes over this paper in one of her first videos. And, um, you know, you can watch these videos and see that we've addressed everything. So we're still waiting for them to address um, something. But, uh, yeah, so the point is they're, they've got a starting position that what we're looking at is millions and millions of years. Or, you know, they'll say that this is just a couple of the hominids. Well, guess what? There was coexistence. We, we could just look at the island dwarfism that has clearly been the result, has clearly taken place with Luzonensis, Floresiensis, Nalidi. Um, so, yeah, this has just been too fun, too easy. Um, actually, right here. So this was Sadiba. Okay, this was uh, one of the papers I was briefly talking about, but the critics like us to go over the data. And uh, let's check out the chat. We've got Mitchell, SFT, you're wrong. We evolved from pond scum by uh, unguided natural chance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We really touch on their so-called mechanisms for evolutionary change with Sal yesterday. Their worthless definition of evolutionary fitness, their best beneficial mutations. They're rare, but they're still reductive. Um they have to define it the way they want, just to even give any type of credibility to their pond scum to people type evolution. It's ridiculous. But what do you expect from those that want to hope, dream, and imagine that pine trees, whales, humans, and apes are all related through common ancestry? Uh, we also uh, spent a great deal in part one on uh, nested hierarchical patterns, homology. Um, yeah, we went to town. So definitely check out part one. Critics want to respond. Definitely check out part one, too. So here we go. Temporal evidence. 2019. Temporal evidence shows Australopithecus sediba is unlikely to be the ancestor of Homo. Right here. Together, these results suggest it is highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. Um, Nicholas says, SFT, will you read my comment if it starts with your initials? <laughs> that's definitely the, uh, that's definitely what pops up at the corner of my eye. Cause what I do, Nicholas, cause right now the screen's shared and I'm going through these papers. So I have no way to, you know, use the comment section from the stream yards, but I do got my phone next to me that I can briefly look over. So yes, if I see the initials, I'll respond. Faithful, honest, and true. Doki Doki, jungle jargon, Alex Cox. Lots of good people in the chat. Jungle Gold. Be ready for tomorrow. Ra, Matt, and I. 99% certain we're going to be interviewing Dr. Charles Jackson. Worst case scenario, maybe next, next week. But we're just waiting on one final confirmation. So, let's see. Together, these results suggest it is highly unlikely that Australopithecus sediba is ancestral to Homo. Now, I want to point out, whenever you get like a new finding or you see something in the news or some fancy article that's saying best evidence for human evolution, new evidence for human evolution, undeniable evidence for human evolution, give it a couple of years. It'll be overturned. <laughs> Maybe give it 40 years sometimes with the uh, baboon bone or Piltdown Man or some of these frauds. You know, give it a few years, give it 50 years <laughs> with their track record. I don't know how anybody believes that ape to man evolution could be true. So here we go. And the most viable candidate ancestral species remains Australopithecus African, uh, afarensis. I'm always, okay, so let's keep going. Um, read through this paper. I've read through a ton of papers and articles recently, but you guys would be bored out of your mind if I went through all of this. <laughs> so here we go. Look at this. The issue, and this is 2019, okay? They're not any more confident. <laughs> you know, they're building skyscrapers. You see some of the movies they make. You know, we're in space. Um, you know, we, we got these cell phones. We can talk to people from across the planet. You know, crazy technological advances. You know, humans have built the space shuttle. But look, you know, 2019, 2020, no more clarity when it comes to human evolution, though. The issue of the origin of Homo is one of the thorniest questions in paleoanthropology and one that has led to myriad proposals. Isn't that funny? Proposals, inferences. Remember, this is their job. They got to go to work for 10 hours a day. You know, they can storyboard all day. They have to. <laughs> what are they going to do? Go to work and say, there's no evidence. We got nothing to do. I got to go find a new job. No, this is what they do. They got to come up with a number of proposals, number of speculations. Look at this. 
And the one has led to a Doki Doki. Thanks so much for the super sticker. So look at this. And one that has led to myriad proposals and sometimes speculations. They're speculating all day, 10 hours a day. This is their job. And still, <laughs> still one of the thorniest questions, human origins. Not for us. Not for us. Fits our model perfectly. We got no reason to force fit the data. Answers to the questions of how, when, and where the earliest representatives of the genus emerged are still in flux, owing especially to the Darth of fossil data. Oh, look at that. <laughs> the fossil data is rather... Uh, Rather flimsy, it seems. Um, so you can keep reading through this. Remember, your pit bulls and your domestic dogs cannot live before the wolf. <laughs> we cannot live before our great, great, great grandfather, grandparents. So, um, yeah, it's, it's it's too much fun. So it's just so funny. Although, so oh, you cherry pick. You know, you want to look at creation sources, or you want to look at. Um, you want to look at creation books like Contested Bones, when in fact, their own literature debunks themselves. So let's go back to the Genesis Apologetics video. Here we go. Presented disingenuously. Sounds so like a human living area. Well, and watch the contradictions come up, right? Because they, they they base a lot of their arguments on the fact that they want to deceive people into thinking that you know you've got your Australopithecines living, in, um, you know, let's say five million years ago. You, you got, and then millions of years later, then your Homo genus arrives, and it's just this clear, clean cut progression, you know, from Australopithecine, more ape like, less ape like pre-human, primitive human than human, right? No, no, there's all this coexistence. It's a mess. And these are the words they use too. It's a mess. There's no more clarity. It's so funny, you know, it, it, and you know, Gutsa Gibbons Young, she can, um, she can change her field. Heck, she can convert to Young Earth Creation and she can start working for AIG. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Uh, yeah, let's keep going. But yeah, the point is they like to use arguments that don't consider the fact that there's all this coexistence. But then when the coexistence is brought up, they can't deny it. They hope people don't bring it up, that people aren't informed enough. But when it is brought up, suddenly they got to explain it away with storyboard and say, we don't understand evolution. Like godless engineer here, who <laughs> couldn't debate his way out of a paper bag, has to say. And they contradict themselves then. Watch. How are you to me? What? How? These guys are genuinely saying that these potential basal shelters and stone tools are human uh notice notice the like the terminology they're constantly using right basal synapomorphies um you know all of these uh derived primitive basal she's saying basal what, what, what do you think this uh, homo erectus in the time period in the situations in the environment in the conditions what do you think they were going to build a, the, the same type of house that I'm sitting in here right now? Basil, right? They want to basil derived. They want people to. It's it's manipulation. It's it's deceiving. They want people to think, oh, basil, you know, more primitive. You know, it's not quite human. These are some kind of subhumans that are. You know, if I got trapped on an island, you know, I, or look at the movie Castaway. Tom Hanks gets um, isolated on an island. What are you know, our houses, quote unquote, or our huts or wherever we're living, what are they going to look like? <laughs> you know what I mean? If these were found, I guess, deep in the fossil record, they'd be considered basal. No, what we know is there's coexistence. They've admitted over and over and over again that what we find is uh, erectus bones, homogeneous with Australopithecus bones. But then it doesn't make for a good story when they say, oh, these stone tools and these huts and these, you know, primitive houses, how living spaces, it doesn't make a good story when they attribute those to humans. You know, they need to attribute them to some type of astralopithecine to fit the story. So uh, it's a shame for the audience how they can probably watch this video and think it's a good rebuttal when informed creationists can sit there with a coffee and just destroy it sentence by sentence. Uh, because humans, you know, make stone tools and shelters, so you know they they must they must be human. Um, 
Yeah. You can see that she had no argument. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're just saying two plus two is four, right? Yeah, two plus two is four. Four. I mean, come on. Two plus two, four. Anyways, let's move on. That's literally what she's, <laughs> she said. She knows deep down inside what we're looking at, what's going on here. But doesn't fit the story. Doesn't fit the story of a single solid like ancestor slowly evolving over time through incremental changes. Descent with modification. Modifying pre-existing structures. Single solid like ancestors evolved in all the life we see today. No, it doesn't fit that story, does it? What about the other animals that make shelters and stone tools? It's, it's absolutely insane. Our gorillas, chimpanzees making the same type of stone tools, same type of shelters that humans would. And like I said, throw me on an island. <laughs> I can tell you, I'm not going to last long. And my shelter is not going to look very good. <laughs> if somebody felt, if, if somebody found my remains on an island or a group of my friends or something, I mean, they're going to, they're going to consider something basal going on. These guys eyeball something and check it off the list. According to Mary Leakey, the lead paleo. Two plus two is four. Check it off the list. So a lot of their arguments are, are psychological, okay, for the for, for the audience, for the layman, for the ones who already hold to, to evolution. But oftentimes very little substance. And here we go. This is this is funny. So, uh-oh, you know, Genesis Apologetics was informed enough and updated enough to um to point out the fact that what we're looking at is coexistence. And paleo anthropologists admit this. Um, so now the, here comes the contradictions, the storytelling, the lack of argumentation. You're going to see Godless Engineer says, we don't understand evolution. I can guarantee that I understand universal common ancestry and descent with modification a lot better than Godless Engineer. And he's the one who believes in it. I feel like I can pretend to be an evolutionist and argue better than these guys. Okay, let's keep going. Expert over the site, the main evidence that the Stone Hut Foundation. Nicholas says, I would do okay on an island, except my metabolism is so fast I would starve immediately. Oh, I know. Talk to my wife, I'm eating all day long, so I wouldn't last very long. Those coconuts ain't going to do it for me. Okay, let's keep going. Was an artificial structure like man made, were the six mounds of heaped rocks around the circle that were evidently used for support poles. She also remarked about the disproportionate number of bones and tools they found outside the hut and not inside, along with a two foot buffer zone around the circle that was mostly clear of tools and bones. The other amazing insight offered by the Leakies, the very scientists who discovered Homo habilis, is that they found fossil evidence leading them to believe that Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus all lived at the Australopithecus, Homo habilis, and Homo erectus lived at the same time in the same place. No, how about Homo, you can't even make this stuff up. How about Homo erectus and Australopithecus lived at the same place at the same time, and Homo habilis is a mix of both. Because you need a story for your ape to man evolution. It's just so funny. But who cares? If you want to agree to disagree with them, then it's still hilarious that they can say that. And then Erica still wants to use her. Well, she didn't even really have an argument. Her argument was two plus two is four. Ha ha ha. But now Godless Engineer is not even going to address all of this amazing evidence suggesting that this is a place of humans, human community. No, he's just going to try and explain away now the coexistence that oftentimes they don't even know exists. They don't even know that's the case. You point it out to them oftentimes and they say, really? No, that's not true. That's not true. That's a creationist argument. Then they go and do some research and they're like, uh-oh, <laughs> this is true. We got to fit it in somehow. So, okay, here we go. Same time. Well, I mean, just speaking from my own very layman understanding of that. Yeah, I think a very layman understanding, I think, still giving them way too much credit. <laughs> Evolution, this would not be surprising. I mean, you know, you had uh, Homo sapiens living alongside Neanderthals and even interbreeding at some point. So, you know. You had uh, Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, Erectus, Nalidi, Floresiensis. You've now had to oust Sediba because. Clearly, Sadiba has now coexisted in a time where probability-wise cannot be in the direct line of Homo, Australopithecus. Erica will want to point to like maybe a, a, a couple of robust Australopithecines and say, well, you know, there, there's a couple here that didn't uh, uh, coexist, but that's just a bunch of nonsense. So it's, it's a world of coexistence. It's a world uh, consistent 
and evidence for the post flood post Bible world. Oh, it wouldn't surprise me if you had some kind of configuration where Homo habilis sort of was living at the time of those two other species. But then again, this chances are probably two species and uh, made up species. But we're you know what's funny? You can just agree to disagree on habilis because guess what? They've got nothing else. Okay. Neanderthalensis, all your hominins, Neanderthalensis, the hobbits, Luzonensis, Rectus, Heidelbergensis, the Australopithecines are all clearly just uh, a, a, an ape type. Sediba has been ousted, and the evidence, which they won't admit to, clearly suggests that Sediba is an artificial species. But we still have Habilis. We still have Habilis. <laughs> they got one example that they can point to. You know, the exception to the rule. That is that is their argument. Remember, their go-to argument is the exception to the rule. Could you imagine? Sometimes I, I wonder. I'm like, if I had to just pretend to be an evolutionist and argue against you know somebody informed in in creation apologetics, it'd be tough. I'd probably have to resort to bones found in the dirt too, because that's where you can do the most storytelling, and that's where you can ignore all the direct lines of evidence. Just shows how much they do not understand about evolution, and they can only twist the information. Oh, oh! So apparently, we don't understand anything about evolution. That's typically their go-to argument, especially when they're cornered, right? Oh, you don't understand evolution, of course. When in fact, it's a lot of storyboarding. How come they haven't mentioned? It's been 20 minutes into this video. Why haven't they mentioned the coexistence? When you see all the data, when you see the bigger picture, then the conclusion with ha Habilis, which they were just discussing, becomes incredibly easy. How come they never point out what Lee Berger pointed out about Australopithecus afarensis? being a chimeric species. Why don't they point these things out? Why do you get to go into their lectures and into their, uh, well, you'll see, I got a book here by Bernard Wood. Uh, we're gonna have some fun. I've got some, I'm gonna, we'll let this go because I wanna get to some good slides. In order to fit their own needs. And that's the only way that their particular hypothesis can make sense, which by the way, just to put it in, into perspective here, their hypothesis is, is that a, a magical wizard in the sky snapped his fingers and created all the animals, including... If you want to see the king of dodgeball, go watch my first debate <laughs> with Godless Engineer and no response to the Y chromosome data, the mitochondrial DNA, the low genetic diversity that suggests we came from two people. If humans have been evolving for millions and millions of years, there should be incredible amounts of genetic diversity. Don't get me started on the out of Africa scenario. How does Godless Engineer explain the fact that the human and chimpanzee Y chromosome is, when you consider overall structure, architecture, gene content, size differences, you're looking at something less than 35%. The author said this is what they'd expect between humans and chimps. Orphan genes, these taxonomically restricted genes, there's no number of mutations that you can give me that can take a non-coding region of our genome into something as functional and as essential as an orphan gene. And we can go down the line, linkage blocks, why do we have so many large linkage blocks if we've been evolving for millions and millions of years? Everything we know from the hat map data, everything we know from these various numbers of genomic projects speaks to independent origins and a literal Adam and Eve. How does he address all the numbers of testable predictions? You know, he wants to say, oh, they look to their magical sky daddy. Well, we can start from a Genesis starting point and we can test the claims and they result in accurate retrodictions, predictions, but uh, you can't expect all this engineer to utilize sophisticated arguments and a sophisticated approach. So let's just, let's sit back here. We've listened to, to a lot of this. We're just going to listen to a couple minutes of this one, though, because this is important, because this is where they say that Christopher Roop, Dr. Sanford, they're not paleoanthropologists. They don't know what they're talking about. You know, and then the best they can do with their book is debunk one or two pages and mostly just misrepresent it. Now, let's see after we've seen the data. Let's see this section now, and you're going to see that what he's saying is perfectly corroborated by the own mouths of the paleoanthropologists. I have a bone that does not belong to this skeleton. And so I wonder, and I am skeptical, and I'll reserve my judgments for now until we get a publication, that there might be other bones that do not belong to Lucy's skeleton. And now Sedaba, same thing. They found Sedaba in a pit with thousands of bones of all kinds of different African fauna, 34% complete for one skeleton and 46% I'm just going to move this a bit. Okay. Of the this is what I'm looking for. The coexistence. A very fragmentary 
very poorly preserved. Okay. Why right is here. it that we don't oh, see the missing links of very complete skeletons? Or if we do, um, uh, oftentimes they're in mixed bone beds. And it's, okay, so here's a picture of Turkana boy, which is clearly human. And even the Bishop of Kenya says that he wants the skeleton back to give it a proper burial instead of putting it in the museum. And so experts are now pretty surprised since 1984 was discovered. They say it looks like Homo erectus is much more human than we ever imagined. And so here's on the right, though, is a missing link. Uh, belongs to Homo habilis. But if you notice, uh, look how fragmentary the missing link is. OK. The next major theme we found is that we, we are observing, we are finding that there is an extensive coexistence of the Australopith type with man. That's really interesting because let me just read this quote. So here's from an expert in the field who's saying, humans first evolved in Africa, in East Africa, about 2.5 million years ago, and from an earlier genus of apes called Australopithecus. So this represents the, the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that we've been taught since the 70s to the present. And it claims that Australopithecines, like Lucy's kind. And what's funny is exactly what they hope for, right? Because then they can convince everybody so um, it, it'd be so much easier for them to convince the public that ape to man evolution is true. You know, we started off uh, as some type of astralopithecine and uh, evolved slowly into the primitive human and eventually modern human. But in fact, it's, it's the exact opposite. And they hate it. You know, if they could have it a, another way, they would. And that's why they try and make it sound like that the way that it's not is the way that it is which lived about three to four million years ago, gave rise to the earliest members of the genus Homo, such as Homo habilis. And that happened around 2.5 million years ago, the, the earliest members of the genus Homo arose. And so, but now we are finding a lot of evidence, mounting evidence that anatomically modern human bones are being found in the deepest layers where we find the earliest Australopiths. So that calls into question the fundamental assumption of the ape to man story that is currently being taught all around even the world. And so has this claim though been confirmed by the fossil record? And so I, as I just said, um, we're seeing a reversal of that, of this story. So here is just some evidence. In the 1970s, which is considered the golden decade of paleoanthropology research, that time, that time. I'm telling you, sometimes when you listen to their lectures or you listen or you read their books and then you listen to a lecture here by Christopher Roop, who's a young earth creationist. If you didn't know any better, you just think that he was also a paleoanthropologist. But because he's a young earth creationist, they're going to try and nitpick. I mean, these are all things that you can find in their own literature and their own lectures and videos and discussions. Time period in history was instrumental for giving rise to the modern theory. And so at these three major East African sites in Kenya, in, um, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, and in, and in uh, Tanzania, they found numerous uh, thousands of butchered bones, a diversity of stone tools, human footprints, human bones, a windbreak shelter in all the vi, commun communal centers and living sites. So they found extensive evidence of human culture and human behavior, and even humans buried with Australopiths. And that's interesting. So if we if Australopiths gave rise to modern humans, why are we why are they found buried together? So here's famous paleoanthropologist Richard Leakey. He comments on this finding and he says, I see no reason that bands of Homo would not have killed and eaten robust Australopithecines when they could, just as they killed and ate antelopes and other prey animals. And indeed, they. Isn't that so funny? How? How could you get Homo bones and Australopithecus bones in the same place at the same time? In the same layers. <laughs> well, let's just read this quote. I see no reason that bands of Homo would not have killed and eaten robust Australopithecines when they could, just as they killed and ate antelopes and other prey animals. So isn't it so funny that humans all throughout history have essentially eaten everything, especially during these desperate times of stress, survivorship, conquest, the rebuilding of communities and culture that was pretty well lost based on what occurred. With the, with the flood and the post babel dispersal and the confusion of the languages. So, you know, just, just silly questions. You know, it, it was claimed by Gutsy Gibbon. And it was quite funny, I got to say, but it was just a misrepresentation. It also goes against many quotes, many papers, many lectures from the paleoanthropologists themselves. 
she said, uh, you know, what happened? Did an australopithecine and a human, were they out going for a jog and they ran into each other and exploded and got all their bones together? <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, it's, but judging by this quote, you can get the bones together the exact same reason why you would have uh, game animals, prey animals, animals that they ate in the same places, right? Because if this is what their living areas. Um, so it's just nothing really convincing yet from the evolutionist side. So if this is what, you know, we're to expect with the genetics and the direct lines of evidence, you know, we're not keeping our hopes up here. Find these sites and they call them living sites. They're effectively like campsites where they would butcher remains, they would eat them, they would apparently, uh, experts even said it appears that they have normal human social behavior. And so they're picture nomadic tribes that are simply hunting and eating these, these animals. Richard Leakey in Nature in 1971, he says, there seems no evidence, however, and by the way, his views haven't, varied, haven't changed much since then. I've uh, been able to talk to him recently. He says, there seems no evidence, however, that the genus Homo at Rudolph, which is Easter Kana, um, had any direct relationship to the Australopithecine population of the same time with which it shared its habitat. The concept of gracile, which means uh, lightly built, Australopithecine being ancestral to Homo and the lower Pleistocene requires careful reexamination. The Lake Turkana material, or East Turkana material, seems to confirm the view developed as a result of work at all the Vigorge, that's Tanzania, that Homo and Australopithecus are two quite separate and distinct early Pleistocene hominins. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the Australopiths did not give rise to the genus Homo, but they were two distinct parallel lineages. They Isn't it funny how this is what we've always been saying? And I'll show you a phylogeny that I presented in a prior video that makes complete sense of the data where we've got humankind as their own separate kind and we've got all the different ape types including the australopithecines if they coexisted at the exact same time two quite separate and distinct early pliocene hominids and yet this is exact because remember a simple presuppositional or a difference in assumptions and worldview can lead to a totally different and according to in when it comes to the deep time evolution story totally wrong starting point and conclusion because clearly what we see here is exactly what we'd expect based on the out of middle east model where they live together the animal types the ape types, they would have actually migrated. They didn't congregate in one spot like they did at Babel. Um, okay, we'll keep going. They coexisted and they don't have a relationship with each other. He Can you imagine, based on what we learned at the beginning and based on what we were listening to with Lee Berger when it comes to body plan adaptation and just how much variation you can get in the same species, especially based on epigenetics, based on environment, based on built-in mechanisms for adaptive change. Can you imagine in this post-flood world or these isolated and inbreeding related conditions in the post babel world, can you imagine the types of novel uh, body plans or divergent body plans like you see with the, the Neanderthals with their robustness? Can you just picture the uh, unique traits that when dug up, when analyzed from the evolutionists with their basic presupposition, they can come up with all sorts of stories. But what we know today about how morphology and anatomy can deceive us, what we know about the variability of species, this is the reason why there's no more clarity. It's a bushy mess. They're constantly, constantly having to go back to the data. And just as we see here, requires careful re-examination. They've examined it, they gotta re-examine it. And then new findings, they gotta re-examine that one. It's a big ripple effect of re-examination. He believed that the common ancestor would be much earlier. We still haven't found it around four to six million years ago. We still haven't found that common ancestor. So his view in a way uh, is somewhat reminiscent of the biblical perspective where we see Australopith and man coexisting, okay? Now here's the interesting history that I wanna share with you. According to God, this engineer, well, you just don't understand evolution. Then quit using arguments that you think are only evidence for your position when in fact, you're not using an honest argument. You're using what's called a straw man. It's a straw man understanding of our model. Accept the coexistence and look to a differentiating line of evidence. 
That's why it's so funny when you go into a debate with these evolutions and they're pointing to homology, they're pointing to some mosaics, nested hierarchical patterns, they're pointing to all these, that they might as well just point to the sky being blue and the earth being a sphere. No, these are, these are neutral to the debate between creation versus evolution. They're agnostic. We need to look to the differentiating lines of evidence. So, uh, but that would require a proper understanding of the interlocutor's model. And that's oftentimes what the evolutionist lacks. So are we finding these types of evidences like stone tools, human bones, and so forth, dating even to the time of Lucy's kind, three, four million years ago, which is prior to the origin of the genus Homo? You can understand why that would be a problem, right? Previously in the video of the Genesis Apologetics one, Erica said, don't you see the reason why we are concluding something like this? I don't want to put words in her mouth. I really only watched it once and then the second half again, so maybe one and a half. But she said something along the lines of, don't you see Habilis? You know, it's, it's intermediate because of the dating between the Australopithecines and, you know, some of your later homos. It's almost like facepalm. It's like, are you kidding me? Based on your own dating methods, based on your own analyses, based on your own assumptions, based on your own conclusions, Habilis, Erectus, and the Australopithecines coexisted. They lived together at the same place in the same time. And then that's where the contradiction comes in. I thought it was so funny. Then you have a godless engineer saying, well, you don't understand evolution, admitting that this is true. But yet an argument was used previously that assumed it wasn't true. You know, this is what we're dealing with. Just like the anatomical contradictions we find in Sediba, <laughs> this is what we see in the arguments from the evolutionists. Contradictory arguments. It's a contradictory worldview. So are we finding examples of that? Well, we are. And they were described by none other, none other than even Donald Johansson himself. In the 1970s, Anna Leakey's, Mary Leakey and Richard Leakey. So they found human limb bones, human jaw bones, human hands, human foot bones, human footprints. And well, you know, of course, Erica's not going to agree with the footprints, though. <laughs> but she'll have to agree with the foot, the foot bones, the hands, the jaw bones, the limb bones. Um, you know, this coexistence is admitted. Okay, it just it needs to be accepted, and therefore their argumentations, like Dan always says, they need better arguments. Quit using the straw man arguments. And as if those footprints, you know, uh, in a paper, a desperate paper, in an attempt at the uh, Laetoli footprints, Erica presented another paper that looked, they looked a little intermediate when they did this really, really uh, minute assessment of, of the details. And it's like, did Erectus, who they often say coexisted during this time, yet we know there's a greater coexistence too. Did their footprints look exactly like modern humans? I mean, you can see some, some anomalous and atypical features in, in Erectus versus modern humans. Therefore, they probably had an, some atypical uh, features in other body parts too. But, but the point is, uh, when you actually study it as a whole, what you're seeing is the, even the footprints are claimed to be absolutely 100% modern human looking. So, but regardless, the evidence is there. They want to just fight the footprints for some weird reason since the homo genus and the Australopithecines coexisted. So deal with it. And by the way, they didn't just refer to these as just in general, the homo type, because that can be pretty broad according to their definition. They would actually describe them as indistinguishable from modern homo sapiens, even homo sapiens. And so this is an interesting bit of history that I'm discussing here. So what happened? And well, in 1976, Donald Johansson and his colleague even reported in the journal Nature that they're... Anyways, we've gone over this a bunch of times. So let me move to, um, you know, I want to go over some quotes here. Okay. So check out that video. Um, but let's see. Let, let's see, you know, Erica's... Um, she gives that impression that it's, it's such high quality, high confidence science. So... Um, these are some quotes from, actually, I want to point this, this one out. This is a paper, okay? I, don't know, I, I think I have the paper actually pulled up too, so I'll go to it. But this is a, a quote that's interesting. Interesting paper too, read it all. So it says, the inevitable debate began immediately with Robinson in 1965, in particular questioning the new species, arguing that the fossils assigned to Homo habilis were a complex mix of Australopithecus and Homo erectus remains. The species name has stuck. But half a century later, it is still unclear which fossils beyond OH7 as a holotype 
can be securely attributed to it. It is also unclear whether these remains and those subsequently variably included within Homo habilis or Homo rudolfensis belong in Homo or Australopithecus. Um, so the point is everything's contested in paleoanthropology. As creationists, we should just read their own literature to debunk human evolution. And it also leads to a good laugh. So I believe, where's the paper? 100 years of paleoanthropology. Um, very interesting paper going. I think it even goes over um, Piltdown Man. And yeah, there's, like I said, the title is The Bones Are Contested because they really are. And this goes through the years. That quote is from this paper. Definitely check it out. So let's go back to this slideshow. So um, I'm going to move this screen. Let's see. Let's see what the paleo experts say. Um, it'll be easier for me to just read from the book. So I'm going to pull it up. Page 69. Let's see. Um, okay. Here we go. This is an interesting one. M remember earlier when they, uh, at the TED Talk, how the same species was actually designated as multiple species, same species just in different developmental windows or different stages of, of life, adolescence, adulthood. Uh, but the chimps have no fossil record. This is from Bernard Wood, uh, Human Evolution book. This is, an in, this is interesting too. Um, and not, not, not pointed out enough either, I think. If modern humans and chimpanzees are each other's closest living relative, then both have been evolving separately for the same length of time. As we will see in the subsequent chapters of this book, modern humans have a substantial fossil record, much better than that for many other animals. But the fossil record for chimpanzees is virtually non-existent. The Panin only fossil evidence in the last 8 million years or 700,000 ago old isolated teeth from a site called Baringo in Kenya. Odd. Certainly in the past, it has been explained that because chimps lived in the forest and because there is little chance of erosion in the forest, then there are no exposures and thus no places where fossils could be uncovered by erosion. Remember storyboards. Others say that high levels of humic acid in the soils of forest dissolve bones before they can be fossilized. We're going to get to the interesting part in one second. Neither of these explanations is wholly convincing. That's what I was thinking too. I'm glad we agree. Fossils are difficult to find in forest, but they are there. They just do not happen to include any fossil evidence belonging to panins. Of course, some of the fossils assigned to Artipithecus, Aurorin, and Sah Sahelanthropus could be panins. But no one has been anxious to forego the chance, listen to this closely, to forego the chance of being the discoverer of the earliest hominin in favor of being the discoverer of the earliest panin. See how they're doing their best to find the most anomalous, atypical features. This is why oftentimes you may have um, an ancestor to a chimpanzee or a gorilla or a bonobo or any one of the living great apes today, the, the ape types that are wrongly assigned to what they want to be, you know, a, a new species or uh, wrongly assigned to a, an existing species from the fossil record. You know, why do they have almost no fossil record? Why is supposedly the human fossil record, what does it say here? Um, we, uh, the modern humans have a substantial fossil record. You know, everybody wants to find the next big missing link. They pick up the most atypical bone, the most anomalous bone, these splitters versus lumpers. These splitters want to look at any morphological different difference. Now, here's the thing. Chimpanzees today have incredible variation within themselves, more than humans and Neanderthals actually have. Humans have incredible low var uh, variation. Therefore, the ape type, your chimpanzees, your gorillas, your bonomos, they have a lot of variation today. Therefore, in the past, Okay, in the fossil record, we'd also be looking at a lot of variation. But look, chimps have almost no fossil record. Oh, I'm sure that they found plenty. I'm sure that they found plenty. But just like he says here, um, nobody wants, no one has been anxious to forego the chance of being the discoverer of the earliest hominin. Remember, it's very inclusive, very uh, specialized field where government grants are at stake, fame is at stake. Um, so it's interesting. So you can see all of this kind of stuff throughout the book. Let's see the next one I have here. 
We'll go to the next slide. Gaps in biases in the Hamann fossil record. Now, here's the thing. The fossil record is low confidence science, low quality science, because it requires incredible biases, assumptions. It's not repeatable. It's not testable. Um, so here we go. Over many decades, paleoanthropologists have accumulated hominin fossils from thousands of individuals going back to between six and seven million years ago. While this number may sound impressive, the majority are concentrated in the later part of the hominin fossil record. Besides this temporal bias, the hominin fossil record has other biases and weaknesses. The science of working out these biases and trying to correct them is the topic of taphonomy. Whereas some of the hardest parts of the skeleton, such as the teeth and the mandible, are well represented in the hominin fossil record, the postcranial skeleton, that is the vertebral column and the limbs, are particularly, uh, the, 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 the vertebral column and the hands and feet are poorly represented. The relative durability of different parts of the skeleton, for example, mandibles are generally heavier and are made of denser bone than vertebra, is partly responsible for the differential preservation of body parts. Lighter bones like vertebra are likely to be swept along in the floods that follow torrential rain and then carried out into a lake where they will be mixed in with the fossilized bones of fish and crocodiles. In contrast, heavier bones like skulls and jaws will fall to the bottom of the floodwaters, get trapped in the stones on the bed of the stream or river, and are thus preserved in sediments that preserve the heavier bones of other terrestrial animals. Um, there's one here that, here we go. Reconstructing whole fossils from fragments. Hominin fossils several million of years old are seldom found in good condition. This is true. The brain case and the face are particularly fragile and are easily trampled by hoofed animals and crushed by rocks falling from the roof of a cave. Sometimes just one fragment of the brain case is all that is left of a cranium. Oftentimes you'll get the image of a full skull when in fact it's all reconstructed based on one fragment. In a few cases, more is preserved. But if the pieces are tiny, it is a challenge to reassemble them. It is like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle with lots, of, with lots of sky, no clouds, and with no picture to help you. One option is to painstakingly reassemble the pieces by hand. But this can take hundreds of hours, even by a skilled anatomist who knows every detail of a skull. This is why it's funny where, you know, Gutsy Gibbon will ask the question like, well, this hand seems to fit perfectly to the arm you know, with Sidiba, it's like when it comes to the three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle, where you've got all these different fragments or just even just taking the, the arm and, and hand uh, from two creatures that are more morphologically similar, well, you can superficially get what seems to be a fit. And when they say perfect, it's very, very imperfect. Um, and like they said, you know, painstakingly reassembling these pieces would take hundreds of hours, even by a skilled anatomist, too. Um, so what's funny is uh, reconstructions, lots of uh, fragments. Um, even here, I'm just going to go to the page because this one's a harder to tell. 41. It's, it's just it's low quality science. It's, it's low confidence science. Determining age and sex is difficult. Even if one has a complete or nearly complete skeleton, determining the sex and developmental age of hominin fossil remains can be difficult. And that's what's funny. You can see like chimpanzees during different stages of their life often have pretty big variations and in, in differences. Where in the fossil record, you've seen it earlier with the TED Talk um, points that they've often taken the same species that's just different stages of its life and actually designated them different species. So these difficulties are compounded when all that remains are small fragments of a cranium. The age at death of a fossil individual that has finished growing is difficult to determine precisely. And they do have some that are more articulated, some that are in situ, you know, Gutsy Gibbon has shown some, but that doesn't change the fact, that doesn't help them at all. The ones that are really fully articulated, the ones where you can actually make a conclusion, I guarantee you it's going to be quite easy to conclude whether this is some type of astralopithecine, whether this is somebody that belongs to the homo genus. Um, the exception proves the rule though. And it's, it's the, the rule that sometimes makes the exception difficult, confusing, 
um, messy. So the age at death of a fossil individual that has finished growing is difficult to determine precisely. Dental development can help determine the age of immature individuals. But once all the teeth are erupted and the roots of the teeth are formed, dental evidence is less useful. The size and shape of the bones and teeth, the extent of muscle markings and the size and shape of uh, the pelvis, although pelvic fragments are rare in the hominin fossil record, are the usual ways the sex of an individual fossil is determined. The underlying assumption is that because in many non-human primates, males are larger than females, then early hominin males were also likely to have been larger than early hominin females. This is one aspect of sexual dimorphism, a term that refers to all the differences among individuals that are related to their sex. However, when you are dealing with a sparse fossil record, overall size is not always a reliable guide to sex. So there's a lot of unreliability going on. You've heard before that morphology can be deceiving. Um, you know, we like the genetics, we like the biology, we like the direct lines of evidence. Species identification is often difficult. Uh, the most widely used scientific definition of a species is the biological species concept that is linked with the late Ernst Mayer, a distinguished Harvard evolutionary biologist. This suggests that a species is a group of interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such groups. This is all well and good when you can observe living animals and check who is mating with whom. So true. But it is self-evident that this method will not work when we try to recognize species in the fossil record. However, because members of the same species mate with each other, and not with members of another species. They resemble each other more closely than they do individuals belonging to any species. But remember, but remember a lot more variation oftentimes within the same species than between species, especially in a time where we are finding these so-called pre-humans, the Australopithecines. We are living in a time where adaptive episodes through environment, through inbreeding, through isolation, through environmental related conditions would be massive. Um, uh, so let's see here. Thus, in the absence of information of its mating habits, we can use the appearance structure, the genetic makeup of an individual fossil, if they actually have the genetics. And that's what we point out. When we do have the genetics, it's amazing how well it confirms biblical creation. Um, he points out, but there are problems when researchers try to apply these methods to the fossil record. The first difficulty is that we do not have complete animals in the hominin fossil record. It is customary to divide the components of animals into two categories, soft tissues such as muscles, nerves, arteries, and hard tissues such as bones and teeth. The fossil record for human ancestors is restricted to the remains of what? Hard tissues. And many of these are just fragments of bones and teeth. So the problem for paleoanthropologists is how to assign a fossil to a species when the only evidence you have is what? Several worn and broken teeth or a piece of jaw or part of a thigh bone.